Hello, I'm Llewellyn King for MECFS Alert. Today I'm at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston with Dr. Ronald Tompkins, who has an extraordinary history as a researcher, as a clinician, as a man of medicine, a man of science, and it is a pleasure to talk to him, primarily about inflammation and the role of inflammation with MECFS. Doctor, welcome. Well, to our thank broadcast. you for now. You're a very interesting man because I've been reading up on you and somewhat talking to you that you have a degree in electrical chemical chemical engineering from MIT. That's quite a far distance from most medicine. You were a major surgeon, and you have been running one of the largest research programs, probably the largest private research program into a bunch of diseases that loosely are around inflammation. Uh, tell us your story and how this came and how inflammation plays into a study of myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, my clinical career has been as a uh, surgeon caring for patients with serious injury, both blunt trauma and uh, burn injury. Uh, in those diseases, uh, there is on a scale of 1 to 10, inflammation is a 10. And its impact on metabolism and neural function are uh, essential parts of the pathology of the disorder. And over our career since the 70s, uh, the likelihood of survival has tremendously increased uh, to the point in the field we're considering quality of life issues. So I, I consider that a real, it, it's, I stand on the shoulders of many of my predecessors who began that, but over the last few decades, we have done a fine job at that. My introduction to ME was through one of my closest colleagues, Ron Davis, and I had gotten to know his son, who is stricken with the disease in a in a very severe Ron form? Davis is in California, right? Ron Davis is at Stanford Genome Technology Center, right? Uh, and we've had a very fruitful uh, collaboration for uh, almost two decades. Uh, very productive, and in doing so, I got I, I, Ron got me involved in the disease process. And I've met many patients. I, I have never cared for an ME patient, but I certainly have cared for many patients with, with diseases in which neurology, inflammation, and metabolism are critical. And I have been on the advisory board for the Open Medical Fo Medicine Foundation and have gotten to know many individuals in the field. And I think that I can contribute substantially coming from a, a very extensive uh, background in the field of inflammation and metabolism. Tell me a little about the research here. Uh, it has been better funded than most research. I saw on the internet that your funding was at one point at $200 million, which is substantial. What have you learned? What have you learned that has a bearing on myalgia and cephalomyelitis? Two of the larger programs, one was a GLU grant, 10-year uh, funded um, at... What uh, is a GLU grant? It, it was a strange thing. It was, uh, it, it, thinking back, um, there was a time when uh, there was a war on cancer, and then there were, the economy allowed uh, expansion in the NIH budget. And during that time period, many of us met with the leadership at NIH, and we said that larger programs that would put a group of investigators with many different disciplines together to attack the same problem in a large scale would, would be of tremendous benefit to uh, mankind. And one of the programs, and then they were euphemistically described as glue, gluing together many disciplines in order to, uh, to allow a, a wide enough scope to address a problem that really matters. That's why it was called glue. And in ours, it was about patients who 
were injured seriously enough to have a one in five chance of uh, succumbing from the injury. Uh, so in those cases, the role of inflammation is tremendous. It's almost maximized. And one way to learn about a system is to look at a maximal deviation. And in those cases, any gene that can respond has responded. And it doesn't recover to normality until the driver for that uh, deviation is resolved. And it turns out in, in our circulating blood, 80% of our genes respond in those, in, uh, those injury situations. It is the maximal response. What is the role of inflammation in ME? In my opinion, and there is, there is beginning to be some evidence, uh, focal areas of inflammation within the brain, as we know occurs in so many other neurological diseases, I am sure are involved in ME. Um, and there are multiple nuclei, and that's one of the areas that we will uh, be focusing here. We have a, a wonderful facility across two facilities here, the Martino Center for Imaging as well as the Gordon Center that combines uh, uh, magnetic resonance uh, as well as specific uh, labeling uh, compounds to identify activities in specific areas of the brain, both using MR as well as positron emission tomography, PET, radio labels. And I think in doing so, we can get a much greater understanding of the degree of inflammation in these sites. It, it turns out that, that inflammation is very important in many other neurological diseases like Parkinson's and like uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. And there are drugs being developed uh, specifically targeting uh, fo focus uh, multiple uh, uh, nuclei in the brain and that could potentially be of benefit for ME patients. Are you driving towards cure or management of disease? Um, as a doctor, very few things do we cure. Uh, as a, I enjoyed surgery because if you had appendicitis, I could cure that. Or if you have cholecystitis, uh, a gallbladder inflammation, I could cure that by taking it out. In the area of infectious disease, antibiotics have helped us to cure infections. But I must tell you, in the vast majority of most human disease, high blood pressure and, and depression and other, you're merely managing, uh, treating symptoms uh, uh, for the disease. It is my opinion that we take steps in this. One might be fortunate enough to come up with a cure, but my strong impression is that we're going to find better treatments for much of the symptomatology and to make it a chronic disease that one can live with uh, rather, than, rather than cure. I would love if there were a magical bullet, but my experience in medicine tells me that that's not going to happen. But uh, it turns out that a proper treatment of many of the symptoms and understanding that it is a disease and you're treating things that bother you the most that the adaptation to a chronic form of the disease actually is fine. That's being human. And uh, uh, I, I would think we can make great progress in treatment. What do you think of the use of cocktails of compounds? Oh, Co cocktails, we, we, there's some very good examples of how it's worked in cancer. Oh, uh, HIV disease. HIV really. disease, it made it a chronic disease that is uh, not really that fatal. How do we find, there are a lot of compounds out there, thousands and thousands of pills are being developed right. over the decades. Mm. How do we find out how they might apply when they've never been tested, uh, an off-label use? And how do we find out where several of them together will do much better than one alone? You can target drug development uh, much more effectively and efficiently if you understand underlying mechanisms better um, and uh, in a very rigorous way. Um, it, it is very helpful. 
if you know how drugs function and you know the targets in ME that are that might be fruitful to target then the pr that process is much easier you have expressed to me how terribly seriously or how terrible you find ME to be as a disease uh, more than other diseases a chance that are equally s that are serious diseases but the impact on the life of ME is so terrible can you quantify that in any way in the severe form it, it is uh, a, a most debilitating disease and if one were to add insult to that injury uh, so few of uh, clinicians actually appreciate it as a physical disease. M my interaction with patients, I, I fully believe that it's a real disease and of major impact and uh, should be better understood. I think that to date, the amount of time and effort and resources spent to better understand the disease has been modest at best and and I would honestly say pretty minimal compared to the so many other diseases that I, I, I might use as, a, as examples certainly it's nowhere in the ballpark of heart disease and cancer but it's not even in the ballpark for Lyme disease or, or other um, similar inflammatory disease processes Fibromyalgia, Correct. which uh, is often lumped with ME, mm -hmm. has similar symptoms. And it's a, I call it a sister disease, and it, and it may ultimately be difficult to distinguish in a, in a systematic fashion between chronic Lyme, fibromyalgia, and ME, and they may just be variants of, of something similar, but they are clearly different from many of the other diseases that receive a tremendous amount of attention. Where do we go in severity from inflammation that can be contained or suppressed or, or ameliorated with an aspirin at the simplest level or, or cortisone um, at further up the scale? Uh, where do we get, what are these severe examples, maybe an ME, of inflammation um, that do not respond to these quick and easy fixes? Uh, to one, to one I, I, I have two answers um, for, for that. There's a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, degree and a matter of tissue involvement. And it's unfortunate that probably neural involvement of inflammation is a, a very important component of uh, ME, but one can't biopsy that. And uh, we, the, much of the prior research has simply been looking in circulating blood. And uh, the, I, I always view the circulating blood as like the sewer and uh, this, is a, it, it, this is from many different uh, angles, um, it is the way that breakdown products from cells actually are eliminated from the body depending on their degree of polarity, whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic, the liver or kidney eliminates it. So much of what you find in the blood has come from the tissues themselves, but the brain and these small nuclei in the brain are very small uh, entities and trying to discover pathologies in these small tissue entities by simply looking in the blood is uh, in, in some ways is a fool's errand and so but I, I do think that new technologies in in uh, MR and in some of the neural imaging and positron emission tomography PET um, have opportunity for us to do imaging biopsies of specific tissues. Very small nuclear changes can have tremendous impact on our neural function. Where the rubber meets the road is a problem with myalgic encephalomyelitis. At the doctor's office, you're sick, you go to see the doctor, he can't get a test that says you've got it. It takes a lot of time. There's no biomarker. No biomarker. It, it, involves a lot of people. Um, that seems to be one of the very large problems. 
It's a huge challenge that uh, faces the field. If one had a biomarker and, and, and consequently a recognition of the disease, a, a un, non-ambiguous recognition of the disease, that by itself would be a, a substantial advance, at least in my mind, for both the patient and the medical community. And so you wouldn't have the waste paper diagnosis. It's not this. It's not for a long time, it was a diagnosis of exclusion, which is never good. And uh, and this most recent 2015. Uh, Institute of Medicine report did come up with some uh, some affirmations of a positive uh, diagnosis if three things were present and maybe others that you have the disease and it's less of an exclusionary diagnosis and I think that was a step forward but we have to admit if we describe a disease by its symptoms it's quite clear we don't understand much about it that's never a good thing Give us an example where we understand a disease and where the symptoms may not be a direct path to understanding what it is. Oh, diabetes. Okay. Diabetes, you can have many different manifestations of diabetes, renal disease, neural, neural diseases, peripheral vascular uh, diseases, uh, and behavioral. But we understand that, uh, that insulin is a critical piece to this and we're able to replace that. Now we often don't know exactly how type 2 diabetes occurs so that we could prevent it, but we do know that it ultimately ends up in uh, insulin resistance and insulin insensitivity of tissues, and which is the diabetic effect. Type 1 is a, is a congenital form in which your cells are not functioning well from the very beginning. That may not even be present. We don't know how that happens, but we do know that's the situation. Do you feel we're on the threshold of finding a biological marker for ME? I think that Columbia uh, is hopeful that it's about two years off. Well, there's a lot of study about metabolomics as opposed to metabolism. I would make a distinction there. Make the distinction for Metabolomics is a snapshot in time looking at many different um, metabolic molecules of interest. So it's a snapshot in time. And the, that's much of what you get when you're looking in research in the field of metabolism. Metabolism is a very different matter. It is looking at, at molecular flow through the body in various tissues. And that is, that is not as, as elegant, no, I, I, I don't mean to say elegant. It's not, it was a field of the 70s and 80s um, when we were very focused on biochemistry. Now we have technologies that can, in a parallel manner, me measure many different molecules simultaneously and so the technological advance of looking at these cross-sectional concentrations of molecules in metabolomics is what has been studied and one can associate possibly some patterns in those molecular con concentrations that might turn out to be diagnostic. Um, I think we're still pretty far away from that. I don't share the uh, enthusiasm as much as many do. Um, do you think there are many triggers for ME? Uh, we have these conflicting situations where most patients I can developed it alone, and yet we've had the clusters, the famous clusters in, yeah. in London. And as though it's contagious. As though it's contagious. Right. I, there must be some common adjutant my, my, so this is conjecture, please uh, 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 allow me, but it's, in, in almost all the cases of, of, of patients that I've in, come encountered or read about, there's been a significant stress. And in, in, in this patient's case, um, they never recovered to normal. 
after that severe stress. Often uh, patients will describe a viral case uh, that they never recovered. Uh, you, you could say the same thing for injury in which they never fully recovered. For some reason, uh, they may have a genetic predisposition to not be able to get completely back to normal. But they remain in a steady state which is different than normal. And in that steady state, um, they're stuck there and it has manifestations. So there are instances, uh, there are some instances in which there's no identifiable initial stress, but it's, it's uh, and I, I would just have to think about how that occurred, uh, the disease might have occurred, but in the vast majority of cases, uh, there is an identifiable infectious or physical or emotional or some form of stress that, uh, you, and I do know in the case of injury, under those stresses, your genomics and your proteomics and your metabolism is grossly different than normal. And it does eventually, in most patients, come back to normal if you look at them and, and examine them carefully after a year or more. It seems that with ME, the immune system is damaged and there's not. It's dysfunctional. Dysfunctional, a better expression. Um, do you see that in a lot of disease? Or is this something? Oh, uh, in, in injury research, it's in, in spades. No, it's not unique in any way. And yet we don't understand as much about the immune system as we would wish to. Or one might expect that we would after so long. The immune system is very interesting. For If you look at it uh, in comparison to just our primate, uh, the other great apes and monkeys, um, we're not even the same as the chimpanzee, which for which we have almost identical uh, genome, 0.5 percent different. But our immunology is in and responses to many pathogens is actually very different. That and so uh, immune system uh, evolutionary wise has undergone tremendous change even since the chimpanzee uh, two million years ago. And uh, certainly trying to compare us to mice, which is where the vast majority of the research is, you know, we deviated from those mammals a long time ago. Uh, there are very many similarities, but there are also very many differences that are, that are very important. So often you need to study human immune disease in humans. Let's talk in conclusion about money. Um, it seems to me that if you look at the research world, it's a lot of pressure groups trying to get a finite amount of money. Some of it raised privately and some of it government money. And that uh, the loudest voice probably gets the most attention. In AIDS, we saw absolute, nobody wants to touch it until people like Elizabeth Taylor got involved. And then it became both attractive to researchers and attractive to financiers government and private, and we got where we are today, where it's a manageable uh, situation. Um, is there some other way we could organize this when the loudest voice or the biggest... Of I think public advocacy is the only way to do it. I, I hate to use the, the ex expression, shame, the, shame them into it, but um, I don't see any better way, the way this dysfunction that occurs in Washington these days, um, I think uh, public advocacy and speaking up, as they did with HIV, is uh, possible. I don't see it changing because it's right. So you, your <laughs> advice to the ME community is speak loudly and often. Correct. Great. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's a great joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.